Hi, I'm Lisa Kordasko, and you're listening to Nosh Holos, Ukrainian Roots Radio. words of Taras Shevchenko, Ukraine's national bard. That was uh, one of his uh, more lighthearted tunes, and the title is Techa Vodas Pid Yavora, which translates as The Water Flowed from Under the Maple Tree. Dobry den, shenovne radio suhachita vitayu vas vsih. Na radio peredachu nash holos radio krinskoho kurenia. Jaka podiaci vam si hodni, tak ki kožni sere dezo de nazi toi do tri nazi toi hodene. Na radio stanci CHLY sto edeni sima fem umisti na najmo. Pri mikrofoni tsu hodenu je povina, a na stupnu hodenu bude z vame Oksana. Jaku ju ščorišale pere bude z name, na stupnih dvoh hoden. Me majma dužici kavi nevene nas jonišni prožami. Hello there and welcome to Nosh Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio, coming to you on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. I'm Paula demchuk Makori, Pokadinska Pavlina, and I'll be your host for this first hour. Oksana will be along at 12 noon to host the show in Ukrainian. I'm delighted to have you with us. We've got a great program lined up for you. In this hour, we have got a information-packed show for you. And we've got uh, another episode of Piss and Kapower podcast, so more uh, tips and pointers on how to do those beautiful Easter eggs. As well, we've got uh, a couple of interviews, one on Ukrainian Jewish heritage, and uh, we'll be looking into the story behind the story of the Rhea Kleiman film, and that is a follow-up on the uh, interview that we had done on Rhea Kleiman, the Canadian journalist who sort of broke the story on the Holodomor back in the 1930s and 30, uh, back in the 1930s. So stay tuned for all of that. And we've also got one more interview with a uh, University of Victoria student who will be telling us all about a uh, mobile classroom that will be parked in Victoria starting on Sunday for a few days. 
So stay tuned for all of that. We've also got our usual proverb of the week, other items of interest, and great Ukrainian music. And coming up next, a popular singer from Ukraine, Oksana Bilozir, with a song, a welcome song, Oi Zelene Jeta Zelene, which translates as Green Grows the Rye. Holodomor National Awareness Tour Bus is a mobile classroom that tours Canada from coast to coast every year. Its goal is to raise awareness among students and the public about the famine genocide known as Holodomor. The Holodomor is a still little-known atrocity committed against the Ukrainian people in 1932 and 33, in which some 7 to 10 million Ukrainians were deliberately starved to death by the Soviet state on direct orders of the communist dictator Joseph Stalin. The Soviet state covered up its genocidal act right up until its collapse in 1991, and the Kremlin still denies it to this day. The Holodomor National Awareness Tour Bus is a state-of-the-art educational vehicle that brings information to Canadians about the Holodomor. It will begin its 2019 cross-Canada tour here on the West Coast in just a few days. Joining us now with the details is Devin Goldie, a UVic student and a member of the Ukrainian-Canadian community in Victoria. Devin, welcome to Nasholos, and thanks for taking the time to speak with us. So, what is your role in the Ukrainian community in Victoria and in organizing this event? I'm with two organizations. So, I'm the president of the UVic Ukrainian Student Society, 
and I'm a board member with the Ukrainian Canadian Cultural Center Society of Vancouver Island. Okay, so there's a very exciting thing happening this weekend. Uh, we've got uh, Bohdan Onischuk, the chair of Hello Demor National Awareness Tour, who will be joining us. Yeah, he'll be joining us for an interview to tell us the story of the new film that'll be part of their tour, Hunger for Truth, The Reacclimate Story. And this is a new addition to the mobile classroom and a big bus that tours across Canada. And it's starting its summer tour, cross Canada tour right here on the West Coast. So why don't you tell us about it? Where it's where is it going to be? Well, it will be here from March 31st to April 3rd. On Sunday, March 31st, it will be at St. Nicholas Ukrainian Catholic Church from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30. And then on the 1st, it's going to be right downtown in front of the legislature buildings, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And it will be there all day. Then the next day on April 2nd, it will be visiting two local high schools. Later on that day, from 4 to 6 p.m., it will be at the Ukrainian Cultural Center on Douglas Street. And then the day after that, on April 3rd, at the University of Victoria. And we'll be there all day from 10 a.m. through to 4 p.m. Have you actually been in the bus yourself? I have. I had the opportunity to see it when it was in town two years ago now. It was parked in front of the Royal BC Museum downtown for two days. And I had the opportunity to take it in. And it's such a fantastic learning experience. It's absolutely wonderful. They have full operational movie theater essentially inside the bus where you can come in and sit down and they have 20 to 25 minute documentaries that they play regularly throughout the day. So you can come in and watch these documentaries that have voices and interviews from survivors and scholars and they have all sorts of additional resource material there's DVDs for sale. It's really amazing, really wonderful opportunity to bring this to Victoria. We were so thrilled when the university gave us permission to have it right in the middle of campus. Yeah. So you saw it two years ago. And of course, they're always adding things. And one of them is the new Rhea Kleiman film, Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman mm-hmm. story. Yeah, that yeah, Bogdan will be telling us a, a little bit about. So I guess you're looking forward to uh, seeing what's new and visiting it again. Very, very much so, especially learning more about Rhea Kleiman. Um, I know that she was incredibly important in bringing knowledge of the Holodomor to Canada. So I'm really excited to see that documentary and to hear what new information they have to share with us. Yeah. So do you know where you'll be going to visit it? I do. I will be at the UVic Day on April 3rd. I'm helping organize that. I'm currently the president of the UVic Ukrainian Student Society, and we have arranged this visit along with the Ukrainian Cultural Center, and we're very, very, very excited to be hosting the bus at the university, especially because April is International Genocide Awareness Month, and there isn't a lot of conversation that happens around the Holodomor at the university. Every year there is a recognition event for the Holocaust, mm-hmm. which is beautiful and so well organized. So it's really exciting to be bringing something about our own culture and this incredibly important historical event and to be sharing it with the wider public and with university students and professors alike. Yeah, that's great. Tell us a little bit about the Ukrainian Students Club at UVic. We're a brand new organization. We started this September, September 2018, and it was started by five of us, a group of us who had the opportunity to get to know each other through a a theater play that we put on the Hmm. year before and really wanted to have an opportunity to get together more and to learn about our culture and celebrate our culture. So we decided to start a club. And we weren't really sure how much success we would meet, but the club very quickly grew. We have about 25 members who regularly attend events, and we have had quite a number of events this year, probably about 15. Wow. We've done workshops, uh, things like collage making workshop. We have a Pisinka workshop coming up this week, movie nights. We've gone to the pierogi dinners at the cultural center. We've done a whole range of events. Wow. and. 
we're really, really thrilled with how great it's turned out, and we're hoping to continue growing next year. Oh, that's great. So, you know, so you're mm-hmm. teaching people how to make Christmas braided bread and, and Easter eggs. and That's and, right. And, and then getting out into the community as well. That's really, really good. Good for you. 25 members. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Well, congratulations on that. Do you have any plans for outreach, maybe expanding and creating one at VIU up here in Nanaimo? Absolutely. That's definitely something that we're hoping to see happen. There has been a few clubs starting to pop up in BC. There's a new one that sprung up at Simon Fraser University as well. So we're really hoping to expand to some of the other universities and maybe even be able to organize a BC Ukrainian students meetup next year. That would be really incredible. Yeah, meetups are great, aren't they? Mm-hmm. It's great to get to know other students and, you know, meet other people who are passionate about your culture. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for sharing the information about the club and about this Holodomor tour bus that's coming. And where can people find you online if they weren't able to uh, jot down the information as you're giving it just now? Is there some place online where people can get the schedule for the tour bus and with the locations and the times as well as uh, how can they reach you, the Ukrainian Students Club at UVic? The schedule is available online on the Facebook page for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress dash Victoria branch. Okay. And the club also has a Facebook page, the UVic Ukrainian Students Society. So that's the best way to reach you is through Facebook? Yes, it is. Okay, super. Well, thanks for sharing that. And congratulations again on forming the Students Club. And I look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. Visuchite radio programu nash holos radio krinsko ho korinya na radio stansi CHLY. Stoi deni sim FM umisti nanaimo. Hovorit pavina. You're listening to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio on CHLY 101.7 FM in beautiful downtown Nanaimo. I'm your host this hour, Pavlina. Coming up next, we've got an incredible storyteller, singer, songwriter from Ukraine by the name of Sashko. Here he is with more of Taras Shevchenko's words. And this is Oikrik Nule Siri Huse, the honking gray geese. Ой, крикнули сірі уси в яру на ставу, Стала слава на все село, протую вдову. Стала слава на все село, протую вдову. Не так слава, не так слава, як той поговір, Що заїздив козак січі до вдови у двір. Що заїздив козак січі до вдови у двір. Вечеряли у світлиці медвино пили, І у хаті на кроваті спочити лягли. І у хаті на кроваті спочити лягли. Не минула тая слава, не марно пройшла, Удовиця у м'ясниці сина привела. Удовиця у м'ясниці сина привела. Вигодувала мало, в школу дала, А й школи його взявши коня купила. А й школи його взявши коня купила. Сиделечко шовком шила, жук пан дорогий, На коника посадила, ляньте ворогі. На коника посадила, ляньте ворогі. Взяла коня за поводи, село провела, Та й привела до обозу, всі що дала. Та й привела до обозу, усі що дала. Hi, I'm Joan Brander, and you're listening to my Pesinka Power podcast. I love Ukrainian egg decorating. I've been doing it for several decades, ever since I was a child. 
I've amassed so much knowledge and experience over those years, I thought that podcasting would be a great way to share my passion with you. I'll be telling you about their history, legends, and symbols. On the practical side, there's tools and techniques used in making them, hints, tips, and do-it-yourself projects to talk about. Did you know that the fate of the world depends on Pesinka? There's an ancient Ukrainian legend that says, as long as Pesinka are being made, evil will not prevail over good in the world. They're one of the greatest traditions of all time, so I hope that my podcast will inspire you. This is episode three, where I'll give you an overview of one of the essential tools for writing Pesinka. It's all about dyes. I'll also give you some hints and money-saving tips. Pardon the pun, but I'm dying to tell you all about these. Here's a list of what you'll learn. Deciding which colors to choose, how to prepare your dyes, how to store them, how long they'll last, tips for using color in your designs, troubleshooting problems and solutions, and finally, where to purchase Pesinka dyes. That's a lot to cover, so let's get into it. I mentioned in episode 2 that when we refer to making Pesinka, we say we write them. Designs are written with beeswax, but colors are put on with dyes. Please don't use ordinary food coloring for this. They'll just give you pale results that you might not like. Only dyes manufactured for eggs will give you the bright, vibrant colors that Pesinka are known for. Of course, you can use natural dyes that I touched on in episode one, but I'll expand on that topic in another installment. I also mentioned that when I first made Pesinka with Baba, my grandmother, we soaked crepe paper in water to make our dyes. Boy, dyeing Pesinka sure has come a long way since then. Before deciding which colors to use, Let's chat a bit about the dyes we use today. They're called aniline dyes, which are basically acid-based. They're non-toxic, so you don't have to worry about using them, even with children. However, keep in mind that these dyes are specifically for pesinke, and pesinke are not to be eaten. There are other Ukrainian Easter eggs that are meant to be eaten, and I'll tell you more about those in future episodes. So now we can talk about which colors to choose. You might be overwhelmed by the variety that's available out there. There's so many to choose from, but don't worry, I'll break it down for you and give you a few pointers. Actually, you don't need a large number of colors to get some stunning results, but you do need some guidelines to help you decide which colors to choose. That's what I'm here for. Keep in mind that I use the words colors and dyes interchangeably but we're basically talking about the same thing. Try to think of all the available colors divided into five groups. The colors are grouped by similarity. For the best results, you would choose one color from each group. So here's the groups. The first one contains the lightest color, such as yellow. Use this color first. In the second group are what I call accent colors. These are dyes such as blue or green. You'll notice in traditional designs that these colors are used in only very small areas. The third group is quite interesting. It contains only one color, orange. You can use it on its own by just covering with melted beeswax the areas on the egg you want to stay orange, or, and here's the interesting part, you can use it as another technique called orange wash. This is a little known and often forgotten way to wash out the accent colors. This is how it works. If you put a blue or green egg into a red or pink dye, the egg is likely to come out a muddy, dirty looking brown color. Nobody likes that. But if you put a blue or green egg into an orange wash, the darker colors will wash away and your egg won't look muddy or dirty. It'll be ready to put into the next group of dyes and come out bright and vibrant. Pardon the pun, but orange, you glad I told you about this neat little trick? The fourth group of dyes are the bright and vibrant colors like red, scarlet, and pink. They give the distinctive punch of color that Pesinka are known for. Finally, you'll use a color from the fifth group. 
These are the darkest colors and they make up the background of your design. The final color gives a dramatic contrast to the light colors, accent colors, and bright colors used in the previous groups. Popular background colors are black, dark red, purple, and royal blue. There's other colors that fall into each of these five groups as well. You'll probably want to add a few more to your supplies as time goes by and you learn more about dyes. But if you want to start with even fewer than the suggested five colors, you can do that too. Three colors that work well together are yellow, red, and black. Take your time and do a little experimenting. Have some fun with color. Of course, before you use your dyes, you'll have to prepare them. So let's talk about that. It's easy enough. Just follow the directions printed on the package. The dyes come in a powder. You simply add boiling water and sometimes vinegar. You can make and store your dyes in glass or plastic jars. Mason jars work just great, as do jars recycled from peanut butter or jam. You'll want to use jars that have a wide mouth. A size that holds between one and a half to two cups of liquid is just the right size to hold the contents of one package of dye and one egg. You don't want a jar so tall that you have to drop your egg into it and it breaks. And you don't want one so wide that the dye won't cover your egg completely. Here's a hint. If you're using a plastic jar, test it in your sink first to make sure it can withstand the temperature of boiling water. Otherwise, it could collapse. And here's a tip when purchasing dyes. Remember that for every color you choose, you'll need a separate jar. People often don't think of that when they're shopping. So here's a question I get asked quite often. Can I only use the dyes once? The answer is no, which always gets a surprising look. Dyes can be used over and over again for about 10 dozen eggs with just one package. It's true. If you do the math, that's 120 eggs, which is why making pesenke is so affordable. That's the good news, and there's some not so good news as well. I'll troubleshoot some problems and help you find solutions. One thing, your dyes could evaporate if you leave them uncovered. That means you'll have to replace them. The solution is a no-brainer. Just keep the lid on the jar when you're not using them. I confess that I'm guilty of this. I'm just so excited and anxious to get to the next step when I write Pesenke, I'm often too lazy to cover the jars. Another thing that could happen is that your dye could get moldy. When this happens, it looks cloudy or has sediment on the surface. You can still use it though. However, if you just can't stand the way it looks, just strain it through a piece of cheesecloth. Bring it to a boil, add one tablespoon of vinegar, Cool to room temperature, and voila, your dye will be good as new. Do you decorate eggs seasonally or for just part of the year? If so, keep your jars in a cool, dark place until you need them. Now, as promised, here are some tips for using color in designing your pesenka. What you want to see in a beautiful pesenka is color contrast. And what I mean by this is light ones next to dark ones. What you don't want to see is one or more of the colors in any of the five groups I mentioned to be next to each other. For example, two or more of the background colors seen close in proximity will not have enough contrast. The colors will look too similar to be distinct. After the time-consuming job of putting beeswax on your egg, you don't want to be disappointed with your final results. If you're like me, you'll probably copy designs from books and pictures, especially if you're a beginner. That way, you won't have to overthink which colors to use. Over time, you'll learn how to use colors that work well together. Before long, you'll be well on your way creating your own combinations. Are you ready to purchase some dyes? If so, I can help you choose them. If you're buying a kit, for example, you may want to kick it up a notch by adding a few more colors. You can purchase all your supplies from my store, Baba's Beeswax. Just go to babasbeeswax.com where you can place an order or just browse around. Combined with everything we discussed about dyes in episode 1, you should now have everything you need to know. I hope you found the information useful. In a future episode, 
I'll tell you all about the symbolism of color. But now, let's go to Books and Bits. In this commentary, I share my favorite books and resources on Pesinka tools to help you make the perfect Pesinka, even if it's your first time. I feature them here and on my website, babasbeeswax.com. A great resource is the Laminated Pesinka Color Sequence Chart, published by Baba's Beeswax. I created it as a guide to answer questions people were always asking me. As a reference and reminder, it covers the five categories of the colors and explains what orange wash is all about. This color sequence chart is a -a one-of-a-kind publication available only from Baba's Beeswax. You can order it through my website, babasbeeswax.com. Before you know it, I'll be broadcasting the next episode of Pesinka Power Podcast. I'll be discussing symbols and the meanings behind them. You'll learn how to look behind the beauty of the decorated egg to see magical designs and secret messages. Before I go, allow me to tell you about Baba's Beeswax and how you can get in touch with me. Back in 1991, sitting around the dining room table with my family, it got me thinking that, well, maybe I should do more with my egg decorating hobby. We came up with the whimsical name Baba's Beeswax. Since then, Baba's Beeswax has been doing a lot of buzzing. We have a website at babasbeeswax.com. Our studio comes alive with workshops and demonstrations. We write books, pamphlets, teaching aids, and videos. We have a library for all the publications we produce and collect. Not only that, we have a gallery of all the pesinka we've made and collected. Please drop by for a visit. We're located in Richmond, British Columbia. If you like shopping in person, it's very easy to get to. We're not far from the Vancouver International Airport. And for our American friends, we're just a few hours drive north of Seattle. For shopping on the internet, you can visit our online store at babasbeeswax.com. We've had it since 1997. Pardon the pun, but we've been buzzing around for a long time. We're doing our best to keep up with technology, so we're connecting with you on YouTube, Facebook, and other platforms. Now we're podcasting, and we're very excited to be doing that. You too can follow the buzz by giving us your comments or a thumbs up. We're here to help you choose kits and supplies, like the beeswax, kiska, and dyes you'll need. You can get everything you need all year round, not only at Easter. In case you missed anything, you can listen to my podcast again. We've put the audio file on our website, babasbeeswax.com. Or you might like reading along, so we've put the transcript there too. That's it for me, Joan Brander of Baba's Beeswax. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. And the late Kvika Sisek with a lively little Kolomeka for you. This look at the radio program Nash Holos, Radio Krinsko Hokorinia, na radio stansi CHLY, stoed any sima femu misti nanaimo. Hovorich Pavlina. You're listening to Nash Holos, Ukrainian Roots Radio on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. And now for a look at Ukraine's rich Jewish heritage, then and now, brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter based in Toronto, Ontario. Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman story, is a Canadian documentary film released last year. It's part of an initiative to increase awareness about the Holodomor, 
the man-made famine genocide perpetrated by Stalin in Ukraine in 1932-33. The centerpiece of this awareness project is the Holodomor Mobile Classroom. This state-of-the-art interactive learning environment travels around Canada engaging students and the public, and it will be here on the West Coast this coming week. During the famine, Soviet officials denied that Ukrainians were dying of starvation by the millions. The vast majority of the Western media were reluctant to antagonize the USSR and either stayed silent or published what the Soviets approved. A few, however, were brave enough to speak the truth about Ukrainians starving at the hands of the Soviet state. Among them, a Jewish-Canadian journalist whose story has only recently been uncovered. Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman story, is a film that brings to life this courageous journalist's 22 eyewitness accounts, published in the Toronto Evening Telegram in 1933. Bohdan Onischuk is chair of the Holodomor National Awareness Tour. He joins us now to tell us the story behind the story of the film, as well as a bit about the Holodomor National Awareness Tour. So, Bhutan, welcome to Nasholis. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for uh, having me. Recently, we spoke with Yaris Balan, who's been doing extensive research on Rhea Kleiman's life and her career in journalism, and he's now working on her biography. Now, he told us that while he and Serge Sipko were compiling reports in the Canadian media about the Holodomor for a book called Starving Ukraine, he came across Rhea Kleiman's work, and then it kind of took on a life of its own, and it ended up as a film as well. Right. Yars is a dear friend, and about two and a half years ago, the awareness tour had asked ourselves the question of what did Canada know about the Great Famine in the 30s, and whether there was anything in any of the newspapers, or whether the legislatures or the Parliament of Canada didn't know anything about it. And at the same time, Yars at the University of Alberta, they were asking themselves uh, the same question, <laughs> and he had started some research. And Yars found this amazing story, one article at the beginning, about this courageous Canadian freelance journalist who uncovered the Lodomar and was the first to write about it. Oh, was she the first? Absolutely. She's the first. She beat Gareth Jones by two months. Oh. Well, she was there in September of 1932, having um, persuaded two U.S. socialites who had a very nice Ford with them to drive her, or she said, I'll be your tour guide, and uh, we'll go through Ukraine, and we'll go through the Caucasus, and we'll end up in Tbilisi, and it'll be a lot of fun. She knew why she wanted to go, and of course, the rest is in our film. Okay, so if people want to see the film, then they're going to uh, need to get to the uh, Holodomor tour bus. (laughs) <laughs> well, yes, at least that, or you can buy the film online from the Canada-Ukraine Foundation from our Hold of the More National Awareness Tour website, and of course we'll ship it out. Great. Um, wanted to know how the film has been received by the Jewish community. Have you had a- any kind of outreach and, and response? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, Raya Kleiman's uh, cousin was uh, Richard Schiff, a Canadian, a very well-known multimillionaire developer who was the chairman of Brahma Lee uh, Corporation here in Toronto. They developed most of Brahma Lee, which is now in the city of Brampton. Oh. Um, and I was actually their lawyer helping them with their land development. He was a dear, dear friend. So he and his wife kept quite a few items pertaining to Rhea. And of course, they corresponded back and forth. But to answer your question more directly, we invited key leaders of the Jewish community for the premiere of the Raya Kleiman story here in Toronto last June mm-hmm. at the Royal Ontario Museum. It was an invitation-only premiere. We had something like 500 people come. Wow. And amongst them were the leaders of the Jewish community, certainly all of the friends of Dick Schiff, who regretfully passed away oh. a number of years ago, but his wife, his kids, of course, all of his friends, including a number of Jewish Canadian journalists, uh, some of them working for the CBC and some for the newspapers. And it was was very well received. Well, that's great. And I I assume that a lot of them didn't really know about Rhea Kleiman either. No, they didn't. Absolutely. And if it weren't for the fact that Yaris tripped over this story by going month by month, day by day, through our newspapers, the main sort of national newspapers back from the 30s, we wouldn't have found the story because the newspapers, the old editions of the newspapers, aren't digitized. Right. 
So right. you couldn't just punch in. Well, of course, Hello Damar wasn't used at the time, but right. you couldn't punch in the Great Famine right. and find it. And it was just by accident that he found it. It was one story. But the unbelievable part of it is she wrote 50 stories. Wow, 50. 50 articles for the newspaper, for the Toronto Telegram, as well as for the British uh, Evening Standard and a number of American newspapers. 22 of those were on Holodomor, and another 28 were on the Soviet Union and the falsehoods and the lies that, you know, yeah. this, this was the greatest thing in yeah. sliced bread in the world, and of course it yeah. wasn't. Yeah. So this film is getting a bit of traction then? Yes, we're working on having Netflix buy it. And, uh, wow. It may be on CBC, or it might be on CTV, or on PBS. So we're working those angles. Great. But the films received very good reviews. It's a documentary of 52 minutes mm -hmm. with uh, minimal advertisement would take it to a normal one hour on television. Mm -hmm. At the oldest documentary film festival in the United States, it won honorable mention, which is their way of giving a second prize to the top documentary. That was at the Dallas uh, Film Festival. It's called the U.S. Film Festival, where all of the documentaries are shown. But, of course, the fact that we retained uh, Andrew Tkach, who was an um, Emmy Award winner, and uh, Christian Amanpour's documentary producer to do the film helped and I had a, a lot of accolades as a result. Wow, so he's a professional producer, so this is uh, obviously right. a really good film. So what is in it, who's narrating it, what does it consist of? Well, our film actually uses Raya Kleiman's own words to drive the story. So it's right from her article. We didn't uh, edit it. We didn't change it. We didn't just give our version of her articles. It's right from her stories. And in between, it's helped along by Anne Applebaum, who acts as almost uh, a moderator or someone who ties the film together. Oh. She had worked with us when she was doing her book. The Red Famine. The Red Famine, that's right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she gave us an interview, which we've used in one of the other short documentaries that we did for the awareness tour. That right. one's called Stalin's Secret Genocide. So it's done in Raya's own words, with Anne Applebaum sort of filling in or giving the background on the famine itself. And then the footage in the film would be very interesting to everybody, but certainly to any historian, because it's all archival footage. We didn't use today's footage to show something meant to be or as it was mm -hmm. in 1932. Andrei Koch worked with Babylon 13 in Kiev and with the um, Dojenko Studios, and we got archival footage from Ukraine, both in film and in photos, of all the relevant time periods, what Moscow looked like, what Cave looked like, what the Ukrainian villages looked like, including the empty villages in many cases, oh, wow. which, which um, Araya talks about in her article, and even Tbilisi, Georgia, which is where she finally got picked up by the NKVD, and they grabbed her, put her on a train, took her back to Moscow, and then kicked her out of the Soviet Union. Right. So she was the first journalist to write about it, and the first and only journalist to be thrown out of the Soviet Union for her stories hmm. in uh, November 1932. And thank goodness that most of her other articles did not appear earlier than that, because then they would have kept her. She might have ended up in the gulag. Yeah, amazing story. Oh. Amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one other thing I'd, I'd mention, because this is also extremely interesting. Because the uh, Ukrainian government knew that we were doing this documentary, and of course, we subsequently showed it in Kiev and were asked to show it in their parliament for the uh, members of parliament. But the Ukrainian uh, security services, the uh, SBU, as they're called in Ukraine, mm -hmm. opened up their archives to us mm -hmm. on the Holodomor from the old NKVD files that had been left behind in Kiev when the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh -huh. You're going to see photos and documents in there that will absolutely make your hair stand on end. These are stories of other individuals who um, were, in most cases, liquidated because of either a photograph they took or something that they wrote about this famine, which never happened, according to the Soviet Union. So, wow. um there are really a lot of interesting aspects to it, but it is a documentary in the classic sense of a documentary, okay. except it's done in a very fast-paced, edgy, journalistic style, because we are targeting this for high school students, for them to get involved, become active in terms of promoting tolerance, 
civility, diversity, human rights, and to make sure that things like this will never happen again. Mm-hmm. It's all done in um, interactive digital format. So it's primarily a series of documentaries and a series of actual lessons where the students have iPads in front of them and their own iPads, and then they actually interact with the facilitator and with the 28-foot screens on the other side. Okay. This is state-of-the-art, digital, interactive, and we've done a whole series of shorter documentaries for the public. There's a 20-minute overview of the Holodomor from beginning to end. Then there's Stalin's Secret Genocide, which is a second documentary. It's 25 minutes, and it's got seven of the world's top historians on Holodomor, including Ann Applebaum, of course, Mugridge, Jones, a number of American historians on Holodomor. So there's about five documentary videos that are available. Okay, this is a great project. It's different. It's quite uh, innovative. How did it come about? Tell us the story of the Holodomor Awareness Tour. It was an idea of a friend of mine who was part of our committee. He professionally designed exhibits all of his life for major mainstream companies in Canada. And because a lot of the blue chip corporates have gone to either market or advertise their products through mobile means, and so they use, in some cases, large tractor trailers, but in other cases, they use buses like the one we bought, Mm -hmm. uh, new which are these RVs, these big rock star buses, as right. they're called, mm-hmm. where the sides push out. And so you create either a living room and a bedroom space, or in this case, we took all of that out and put a classroom with three rows on one side and a 28-wall screen on the other side. Mm. And we took that to um, some sponsors and donors, and we took that to the federal government back five years ago now. And the previous government to this one agreed to help fund it. And in the province of Ontario, the Ministry of Education was so keen when they saw the bus that they threw in $750,000 of their own budget and made this part of the curriculum. So with those two governments fed in for a million five and Ontario at seven fifty, that looked after about three quarters of the cost of the whole program, including transportation and all the associated cost of it, mm-hmm. including going across Canada. Mm-hmm. So this is about the fourth tour that we're doing in the West, starting with BC and then coming back through Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and then comes back to Ontario and goes out to the East Coast. So that was the first program. It was renewed last year by the current government, the Liberal government, because this is not a political issue. Mm -hmm. This is beyond politics. And by the new Conservative government here in Ontario. And that's allowed us to do two additional lessons for school kids on the bus. And we have them ready and in the can. One of them is the Raya Kleiman story. It's be done in an auditorium where they can see the full film and then they have a discussion about it with a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And then there are two classes and two lessons done in the bus with an interactive method of both teaching and then having students involved in searching materials both on their iPads and then then discussing it in a classroom setting. That's fantastic. That's amazing. And we have one... um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pat myself on the back. For sure. Not myself, but, <laughs> but certainly our team on the back. We won three international awards. Oh, congratulations. Uh, all of them in gold. It started with the um, A award given by the international digital design organizations around the world. And a jury of 173 picked us as best in terms of immersive education. And we won gold in Lake Como two years ago. And then at the Apex Awards in Las Vegas, which is the American version of the design awards, and this is a design for the bus and design of the whole interactive, the use of digital, we won gold in our category. And of course, uh, the NFL won gold for their use of digital media in Chicago, where the 2018 Super Bowl was played. Oh, Um, It was a knockout presentation, and it won in its category. But in terms of education, and public institution uses, we we won gold and we were the top winner. Wow. Congratulations. Good work. So how many students have you reached so far? We reached about 35,000 in the four and a half years. We keep those numbers, uh, tabulate them. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the public, it's about the same at various festivals, libraries, community centers in front of city halls and summer festivals. 
that the bus is at during the summer months. So then the tour bus, then I guess every year it goes across Canada? Yes, that's right. Okay, and so this year it's starting out here on the West Coast? Yes, that's right. We start April 1st at the legislative buildings in Victoria. We're there from 9 to 5. Tuesday, we've got school bookings in Victoria. Mm -hmm. It'll be at the Ukrainian Cultural Center from 4 to 6.30. On Wednesday, it's going to be at the University of Victoria all day from 9 to 4.30 by the library. And then from there, it goes to the mainland, and it'll be in the Vancouver area doing school for the rest of that week and the next week. So British Columbia is two weeks. Then it goes to Alberta for three weeks, Saskatchewan for five weeks, because that's where the demand was. Oh. We basically take bookings, mm -hmm. and we're booked solid every day. And then we end up with Manitoba in uh, June, and then the bus comes back to Toronto. Okay. Now, earlier you said there is another film or another version of this film? Uh, yes, there is. There's a, an hour and 27-minute version, which tells the Raya Kleiman story, but it also then intersplices the story in Ukraine today, using the example of one of the sergeants in the Ukrainian army defending the Donbass area, and who's being still held by the Russians in Moscow, along with a whole series of other Ukrainian soldiers, whereas they were supposed to be returned. Ukraine captured quite a lot of Russian military uh, mercenaries, mm -hmm. uh, returned them all to Russia. The Russians have not responded. And that makes the comparisons between what happened in 1932 when Postashev comes in with 112,000 functionaries to create the uh, Holodomor and to close the borders and then to starve the agricultural community uh, to today when Putin's got more than 112,000, either somewhere between 125 and 195,000 military men under arms sitting in Rostov just across the border from Donetsk. And of course, a lot of them are fighting clandestinely in Donetsk and Luhansk with much the same result. We've got 13,000 of our military men and civilians who've died and around another 70,000 injured in one way or another. Well, it's good that this film is getting a lot of exposure. Tell us again, how can people get your film? Well, first of all, we, we will have the film in DVD format on the bus for anybody who wants to buy it. It's $20 uh, copy. Secondly, you can buy it online if you go to our website, www.holodomortour, one word, H-O-L-O-D-O-M-O-R, tour, T-O-U-R, dot C-A. And on the front page, you'll find a button that uh, takes you to the online store. And you'll be able to find Hunger for Truth, the Raya Kleiman story, and Stalin's Secret Genocide, and the other documentaries that we've done in video format. You can order them online, and we'll deliver them at no cost. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much, both Don, for sharing the story and giving us the story behind the story, and also for letting us know about the good work that you're doing. Keep it up. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to do this. Bob Onischuk, chair of Holodomor National Awareness Tour, with the story behind the story of the film Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman story. I'm Pavlina, producer and host of Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio. Until next time, Shalom. Ukrainian Jewish Heritage is brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, based in Toronto, Ontario. To find out more about their work, visit their website and follow them on Facebook and Twitter. Transcripts and audio files of this and earlier broadcasts of Ukrainian Jewish Heritage are available at their website, ukrainianjewishencounter.org, as well as at the Nasholos website, www.nasholos.com. Oh, my
Марічко, люблю тя, люблю тя. Зариш мені когутя, когутя, когутя. Зариш мені когутя, когутя, когутя. Ой, Марічко, чичери, чичери, чичери. Розчиши мені кучери, кучери, кучери. Розчиши мені кучери, кучери, кучери. And Anatoly Rudenko and the Folklore Ensemble Kiev with Marichka. Tsiuhodenu bulaz vame pavina. Nahadiyu vissukhite radio programu Nasholos Radio Nashoho Kurinia. Salashaitis is namina stupnu hodenu. Dali peradiyu mikrofonu oksani. Zaprosh yu posluchite troche pro istoriu i tredeci iros povist oksana. Ale peratiem yo hochu zalashaita vaste kima slovame mudrostea. Shchob volyu mate treba spershu sebe objednatea. And our Proverb of the Week translates as Freedom is Built on Unity. And that brings us to the end of the first hour of Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio here on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. Please stay with us as Oksana takes over the microphone to host the next hour. Meanwhile, please join me here again next Wednesday from 11 a.m. till 12 noon. And until then, do stay in touch with both Oksana and me via our Facebook page and Twitter. In between broadcasts, please visit us online where you'll find transcripts and podcast feeds. And that is at www.nashholos.com. So stay tuned next for the Nashholos Ukrainian Hour with Oksana, followed by Wellness Wednesday to learn how to be healthy naturally. And at 2 p.m., join Gord Bibby for two hours of great oldies on Groovin' with Bibby G. I'm Pavlina. Thanks so much for listening. Do zusichi.